Good afternoon, everyone. I'm terribly sorry for uh, this little technical hitch, uh, as usually happens. Um, one can't rely on technology. So when I started my computer, it's suddenly gone on to this um, update uh, mode. And um, um, so um, finally, here I am. Uh, I must thank Dr. Vijay Sate for inviting me to attend this series and also for um, uh, to Kanchana, who's been helping, helping me a, a, a great deal with uh, putting things up uh, and in, 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 in place. Um, today, we're going to talk about um, how ships, coins, and the sea come together in India in the first millennium uh, of the Christian era. Now, I say it's the first millennium, but it's not exactly the first millennium because, of course, you can't start a story by giving it um, uh, the beginning and the end of it. So, roughly, we shall be focusing on the first millennium, but, of course, I'll start a little bit earlier than chronological spectrum than that and end um, a little bit later uh, after the first millennium. The series says adventures in archaeology and no adventure in archaeology is currently uh, nowadays uh, possible without talking a little bit of theory. So um, when we talk about space, the first first name that comes up in our mind is of Henry Lefebvre, um, who uh, radically changed our notions of looking at spaces. And uh, in his absolutely landmark um, anthropological uh, treatise uh, in the production of space, he says, space is not an inert, neutral, or a pre-existing given, but rather an ongoing production of spatial relations. Space is where people locate themselves. It is dynamic and fluid, and it does not have a fixed boundary as it is created through intersections and mobility. So this is how uh, of space is kind of defined in postmodern thought. Um, how this this whole concept is then uh, applied to archaeology? It has lots of different uh, forms and and concepts which are basic ba based on that. But in a nutshell, um, the basic uh, uh, focus that I'm going to be achieve uh, for keeping on is uh, the concept of network and um, particularly networks in archaeology. Uh, and in that, we are going to concern, consider networks as a medium for social interactions to understand and interpret the resultant patterns of relationships. So this is what the network is trying to achieve, that it, it actually helps us to, um, to, achieve, to understand uh, how, as a medium of social interactions, uh, uh, networks are created and built up. Um, from the viewpoint of the famous actor network theory of uh, Henri Latour, uh, networks uh, are essentially help us to understand uh, uh, relations which are both material and semiotic in, 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 their, in their nature. So, um, so it's in, in, within a network, the, the relations that we are looking at is not just the material concept of it, but also it has a kind of index to it, like it has a particular meaning, it has a, it, uh, you know, the, the, the relations can act as symbols for various things. Um, this concept was further elucidated in a landmark essay by professors, uh, Professor Chris Gostin and Yvonne Marshall in what is called as the, uh, what is the, the title of the essay was The Cultural Life of Objects. And this is very important because coins per se are objects. And um, as they move through these networks, they accrue different meanings. I mean, um, for example, a gold coin that was current uh, circulating in Rome as a medium of exchange of transfer of value, when it reaches India through trade, um, it does not really remain uh, that. It, it, it has, it accrues a different meaning and that meaning is deeply cultural. So this is, this is, this is kind of an example of uh, how objects achieve different meanings in course of their circulation alongside uh, a network. I mean, it's not, of course, it's not necessary that objects should circulate within networks. You know, they could circulate outside the networks as well. But of course, from our perspective, it's important that, you know, we look at this kind of network-based uh, circulation. Similarly, um, the essay, well, the book and the introduction to the book, uh, The Social Life of Things by Arjuna Padurai, has also uh, sort of shaped our understanding of how objects are commodified and how how uh, consumption of particularly what is um, usually seen in trade as elite objects of trade is affected by 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 which processes and how very landmark essays both these and these will uh, situate us uh, help to situate us uh, our study 
Ships on coins is not a, not a, not a, not a, a new thing at all. Uh, uh, very, the very earliest of coins in the world um, are uh, these uh, coins of uh, early Asia Minor, 5th century, 6th century BC. Even in those days, the ships um, had been a kind of emblem of uh, very uh, familiarity put on coins. Um, the Greeks relied a lot on uh, the sea as a, as a connecting uh, medium between different islands, different between, between Asia Minor and the Greek mainland. So ships were definitely a part of much of their trade, commerce, culture, war, conflict, everything. So um, usually on Greek coins, you see parts of ships and sometimes you see whole ships as well, but and uh, the very elaborate kind of rendering. So uh, here on top left, you see an Electrum Stator of 6th century BC from Kizikus. And uh, the front part of the ship is depicted on its obverse, um, a bow, a tuna fish, which is again kind of related to the sea and, and you know, the, the role that the ships played in, in, in this, uh, uh, in, in, in the Greek culture. Similarly, uh, the coin on the right is of a city-state called Phazelis. And here you see two parts of the ship, the front part of the ship on one side and the back part of the ship on one side. Um, ship motives and coins were not, of course, limited to only Greeks. The, the lower coin here is of Phoenicia, and the Phoenicians were one of the first early great uh, seaborne uh, communities uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean. And here you see a fantastic depiction of uh, a, a galley with multiple oars and helmsmen which is depicted on the obverse of these coins and it's very stylized uh, depiction of the waves under, under the galley as well. So um, ships on coins was already very much there right from the inception of uh, coin money in, in the world. However, that was not the case uh, with India. And before Indian coins got associated with the sea, India was blessed with a, a, a massive amount of um, um, coastline, and uh, here you see a map of uh, the networks that were sort of built around uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent using the sea as a connecting medium. Now, this is this is the interesting thing that the sea actually separates the landmass, but the sea as a space, as uh, the historian Fernand Brodel uh, very famously showed, that the sea could be looked into a connecting space as well. So it's not just the sea that is uh, the, the space that separates the land masses, but it's, it's in, in itself is a connecting uh, space in, in its own right. Um, the main uh, facilitators in this, this particular fashion were the north, uh, the two monsoon winds that play in the Indian Ocean, very famously the, the November to February monsoon and the April to September monsoon. And once these winds were, um, discovered. It was a matter of, uh, you know, simply unfurling your sails and sitting in the wind and the, the wind will blow you uh, to the coast of India once you are once you are in the grip of it. Then a few months later, the wind changes direction and um, you could just you could just return on the on the returning wind. So this particular geographic feature of monsoon winds has helped um, nurturing fostering uh, the connections, the trade connections uh, between um, uh, the trading communities uh, of the of the Indian Ocean. However, before uh, this all happened, uh, before the, the sea trade, trade took off, obviously, um, India was also blessed with a lot of um, estuary in trade. There was um, there was a lot of um, um, river systems that were in India, and um, this is a map showing all the river systems of India. And of course, people these were the ancient highways before the, when there were no roads. Uh, when the landmass was filled with forests, um, the rivers turned out to be uh, a very familiar uh, way of um, navigating trade and connecting people. Um, in the Raghuvamsha of Kalidas, we get a very nice description. And he, uh, in, in the 17th uh, Sarga and the 64th verse, you say the caravans of traders freely moved on the rivers as if there was water systems attached to their houses. So he's alluding to uh, the familiarity of the traders with the river systems uh, in as much as they were just, uh, you know, uh, water tanks in their back door, through woods as if they were their pleasure gardens and over mountains as if their own residences. And this they did without the fear of, of pirates, thieves or wild animals. So this is a very good encapsulation uh, in poetic form of how um, the traders moved along these pathways uh, um, uh, in, 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 their, in, the, in the pursuit of their, their endeavors. Um, 
What is actually very fascinating is that the earliest coinage, we're moving about 600 years back from Raghubamusha, um, the earliest coinages in India, about dated to about 4th century or 5th century BC, they show a very market orientation in regard to the river system. So, for example, we have this sort of coins, which are one of the earliest coins in India, which are famously called as Panchmart coins. And um, a lot of these coins uh, have uh, their distributions, which are kind of typical of river valleys. And this is very, very interesting because this actually shows us a very early um, connection between the river valleys, the trade that was going on, and the connections that were uh, being built up. So the five coins that you see here, they're all of the same so-called numismatic type. They're all of the same weight. They, they weigh about one and a half grams, roughly. They all have four symbols punched on them, hence the name punch mark coins. And um, you can see that all of them have an elephant in common. So on the, the top coins, you can see very clearly see the elephant. Then all of them have a pair of symbols, which is, which is, which is punched uh, again uh, at the sort of cardinal ends. And the fourth symbol, apart from these three, kind of varies. So this is, this is how it is. For example, on the top left coin, you see uh, a bull's head-like mark. Uh, on, in, the, in the center left, uh, center top coin, you can see that there are, there are three, three bull-like marks going around a circle. And uh, on, the, on, the, on the extreme right top, you can see that there is a, a tree, a tree uh, which, is, which is at the top end. Um, so these are kind of the characteristic marks, and these coins are known from finds along uh, the, the river system, such as Upper Tapi, Middle Tapi, Upper Vainganga, Upper Godavari, and Upper Mahanadi. So these are, I mean, I'm chosen, I've chosen this because they are kind of uh, very close to Maharashtra in a way, and sometimes, sometimes some of these are part of earliest coins that, that are found in, in, in Maharashtra. So right from a very early times, um, much as Coinage was associated with Greeks and shipping uh, in, in, you know, in, uh, as you in the first slide. In, even in India, coins, coinage, money, and river trade and, and shipping along the rivers actually appears to have gone hand in hand. So this is a very important uh, aspect that is generally overlooked, uh, I must say, um, when uh, people talk about uh, inception and, and circulation of earliest Indian coins. Moving on from these coins, we see that stylized representation of ships actually appear uh, amongst the very earliest of these, these type of coins. So these coins are not just, of course, confined to Maharashtra. They are found in different parts of the country and in, in different uh, kind of, uh, they have different typologies. And uh, it is in the Eastern Bengal, which is now currently Bangladesh, that we see the first ever numismatic depictions of, uh, of ships on coins. And you can see here that the ships are very simple. They are, they are definitely uh, just simply, simplistic versions as kind of crescent with uh, two sort of uh, ends. And we can see that there's a stern and a prow. And uh, in some instances of these coins, you can see that the ship also has a kind of mast in, in the middle. And here you can see that particular feature on the, the top left coin uh, that the, 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 there are these two little masks in 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 the in the in the thing, and um, quite interestingly, it is very very similar to the depictions that we see on Mohenjo-daro seals. And there's, this is a seal published by uh, Mark Kanoya, and this is a very famous example of a seal from one of the Indus Valley repertoires. And um, here you see that uh, this, the 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 ship as it is depicted on this she seal is very much familiar to uh, to the coins that. Obviously, there is there you know there, there is more than one thousand years separating the two objects. However, um, one must remember that um, the kind of stylization that one 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 comes across is the kind of you know the the way people visualize these things is very important. And in most instances, uh, these at, at the very basic, the visualizations can be very very similar. So when the Indus people tried to visualize a boat, it looked like what what it what the seal uh, shows. But the very, very similar kind of visualization was also achieved by the people from Eastern Bengal who were using these particular silver punch marked uh, coins. Um, they are mainly found from two sites in, in Bengal. One is found from Mahastanagar uh, and Bari Bateshwar. And uh, in, from the Indian side, 
the famous site of Chandraketugarh in uh, near Calcutta has also yielded some of these coins. Um, it is actually at Chandraketugarh that we find the, the, the kind of development of these symbols. These two are not actually Chandraketugarh coins. These are examples of Magadhan Karshapanas or five punch marked Magadhan coins where again you see the same sort of stylized ship emblem and here you see it on uh, the sort of top uh, of the of, of, of the coins and on the on the right hand side you can see it's on the on the left punch here you see that it is it is it is really the ship but it is it is shown in a very stylized fashion it's the very very same kind of uh, stylized emblem uh, that you see on the earlier coins as well as as early as as the indus uh, uh, seal so um, they, these are sort of dated to about uh, 4th century BC. So we're sort of slightly moving ahead in, in time. Um, I mentioned Chandraketugarh, and uh, this is what we see on the coins of Chandraketugarh. And the post-Mauryan coinage at Chandraketugarh seems to have generated its own kind of localized uh, punch-marked uh, coin series. And here is an example on top right here. And here you see a very clear depiction of a ship which has a, a, a very high kind of a, 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 a stern and sort of a structure that is uh, uh, inside it, maybe like a house. And then there is uh, at the prow, there is a kind of a flag or some sort of uh, projection that sort of turns backwards and very typical uh, uh, depiction of a ship on a very sort of early uh, Panchma coin from, from Chandraketugar. Um, there are uh, these these punch mark coins from Chandraketugarh are quite well known. However, there are some cast coins from Chandraketugarh as well, which are not very well known. And um, because the the site is uh, so profusely kind of uh, um, contaminated with saline water, that a lot of these cast copper coins are in in uh, in fairly poor condition. But um, on this particular cast copper coin, you could see that on the reverse, there is this kind of ship-like uh, um, um, symbol, which is again, very, very quite similar to uh, the one on the, the, the punch mark coins, but you know, because the coin is not in great condition, you can't really, really see this. Um, Chandraketugar is of course very famous also for seals, uh, terracotta ceilings, which have been found in excavations there and they all have uh, uh, ships on them. And there are three examples um, where the ship is very clearly seen. And um, I must confess that uh, these um, terracotta ceilings have gone into literature uh, uh, on the back of uh, some of the readings that were furnished by uh, Professor B.N. Mukherjee. And um, these, these readings are not really accurate readings. Uh, there is a script on these seals which yet remains to be read. This is one of these kind of classic examples of, uh, um, um, you know, mysterious uh, scripts. And it was Professor Mukherjee's rendering that these, this script is actually composed of uh, mixed characters of Brahmi and Karoshti. And it's a very controversial topic. A lot of people, particularly epigraphists, have, have not agreed to this. However, when he published these seals, he tried to read some things, and uh, those kind of readings have now, more or less, uh, when I was researching to make this presentation, I found that a lot of these readings have been used secondarily by people who are not really epigraphists at all, and they, they're sort of relying on, on Professor Mukherjee's readings. Um, I must really caution that these readings are not, not accurate, and they're very much disputable. Um, however, what is very clear is that the ceilings do have ships on them, and that's 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 something very significant. Um, right from the word go, uh, what I discovered is that when people talk about ships in ancient India, when people talk about the depictions of ships on things like coins and terracotta ceilings, they talk a lot about the, the construction, and there is a lot of discourse about how these uh, boats were constructed, were they made up of planks, were they made up of wood, were they actually you know, were the planks then then uh, tied uh, with 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 ropes, or were they were they nailed together? All sorts of things. This sort of discussion is um, is is available. Um, um, judging by my own experience with these objects, that I find that um, uh, they are the depictions on small objects such as coins and terracotta ceilings are very much stylized. So one one must not really read too much about uh, how how the whole thing is constructed or not. 
into what is being depicted. Remember that there is always an element of style and stylization when you're dealing with uh, visualizing large, immense ob uh, objects onto um, a very small objects. You know, you're just sort of con converting your imagination and then you're putting these things onto uh, um, uh, these little uh, ceilings or coins. What is quite interesting, however, is that um, some of these ceilings do show that there is a basket under uh, inside the ship. So, for example, here on the top right, the ceiling shows that there is a basket of goods inside the ship. And that is what is particularly significant because that actually indicates that this ship was um, definitely used as a, as a trade uh, 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 kind of facilitating um, uh, object. It is not. It is not just any other ship. It is. It is a ship which is being used for trading, and that is that is what is more significant than 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 uh, actually talking about how it is constructed or not. Um, you have moving on from um, uh, from Chandraketugar and second century, uh, third century BC. Um, then ships start appearing in in modern uh, in contemporary uh, art as well. Um, and uh, here are two depictions. One on the on the left is uh, uh, from the stupa at Barhut. It's a medallion, typical medallion that one sees on the the pillars in the Barhut stupa. And here you can see that the, clearly that the, the the artist has shown that the ship is made with planks, and the planks are actually nailed uh, or held together with with some sort of rivets. Uh, that's very clearly visible. Um, of course, when one is actually uh, plying these. Uh, dangerous territories uh, of uh, spaces like water, uh, there are monsters. And this is what the, 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 sh the medallion depicts. Uh, there is a sea monster, um, which is a makara or a, a crocodile-like creature. And you can see that it's actually consuming a ship into its mouth. So that the, the ship above is, is sailing and uh, the, the crocodile monster is actually eating up uh, one, of the, one of the ships. And that, that it's sort of going in its, in its, in its gullet. Um, the depiction on the right hand side is a copy of a frieze from Sanchi. And unfortunately, currently, the situation of this particular stone is that it is it is cut in half and the lower half of the depiction is missing. And the upper half has been sort of recycled in one of the toranas. We, I'm really uh, curious about what exactly uh, what, what must have been the original uh, position of this, this, this particular stone. However, when it was found in 19th century, uh, this was the entire uh, depiction here. And of course, one of the ways to uh, take inspiration, as in uh, maybe from the awe that the creatures, like the, 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 the dangerous creatures inspired, is actually to create boats which were shaped like these kind of uh, uh, myth myth mythical and uh, strange creatures itself. So here we see a depiction of the Buddha crossing the Nairanjana River, and here uh, a, sh uh, a ship itself, which is made with, with a prow, uh, which has a kind of griffin-like uh, animal, winged lion with a, with a parrot's beak. It's a kind of you know these kind of mixed animals that one sees. Down below is uh, a quite interesting depiction of people who are actually floating in the water using buoys uh, or inflatable kind of uh, thing. And uh, as a, as we shall see later, these it's these kind of um, 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 objects that people use to flotation objects really were themselves regarded also as ships in their own right. So it is you know, the ship is not something a vessel in Indian uh, thought and, and in, in concept. A ship is not a vessel that people actually ride in, uh, but people can just keep afloat with. So this is, this is, this is one of the examples of uh, uh, also a ship in a, in a, in a, in a way. Um, in first century AD, we find uh, the monsoon winds, of course, are discovered, quote unquote, of course, you know, monsoon winds have been blowing since probably from the end of the <laughs> beginning of the of the earth, but it, the, the, the utility of monsoon winds uh, was, was uh, particularly discovered in early uh, to mid first century AD, and that unleashed uh, the opening of India's western and eastern coast to a lot of trans-oceanic trade. And one of the best examples uh, um, uh, that one can get uh, their hands on to know how these transoceanic trades were happening is, of course, the famous book, The Periclus of the Eritrean Sea. And I'm sure people must have seen this map hundreds of times. This is the most famous map, uh, which has been now disseminated everywhere, uh, thanks to the internet, about showing 
the places, the, the kingdoms, the commodities, and everything that was that is mentioned in uh, particularly the, uh, the Periplus. As um, people might be aware, um, the Periplus is a guide uh, how, of conducting uh, sea trade to India. We don't know who wrote it. Most likely it was uh, a Hellenistic uh, Egyptian who, who was its author. But it tells you uh, many things. It tells you, uh, you know, if you're traveling from the Eastern Mediterranean down the Red Sea, across the Arabian Sea to India, then you will, you know, hit these places. You will uh, stop here. You will do this sort of trade here. These are the kings and they like this. So it's a kind of a, a tour guide, or, you know, a kind of a manual. Of, of, uh, I always call it a uh, um, Kind of a lonely planet of the ancient world that you know tells you if you're going to go to India, this is what you should do and you shouldn't do, and this is what you should be aware of, and you know this is this is these are the kind of goods that you can take. Um, very interestingly, uh, in this uh, particular manual, uh, there are two uh, passages that I would like to highlight which talk about the kind of ships, and it's not just any ships. I mean, everybody knows that the seas can be crossed using a ship. But the ships then, of course, can, uh, you know, evolve into their own typology. And this is a, a very good ex um, uh, example from the Periplus, uh, section 44, where it is called, where it says that um, well-manned large boats called Trapaga and Kotumba go up the coast as far as Surastrin, from which they pilot vessels to Barugaza. So this is a, a, a description of what is happening when the trading boats from the Red Sea cross the ocean and arrive into very close to uh, the Indian coast, particularly the Gulf of Kambat or Cambay as it is called. And uh, then most of the harbors that the Periplus talks about here are actually tidal harbors. And the, the, the boats are then carried into the harbors along the ascending tide. And it, you know, they're at the mouths of tidal rivers. So, to, to guide these boats um, into uh, properly into the harbor, Periplus mentions that there were these ships, uh, large boats called Trapaga and Kotumba, who were being used um, to, to, uh, to uh, guide the incoming vessels into the harbors. So there is this interesting nexus between um, how the local administrative uh, people, whoever they were, at this time they would be the Western Shatraps, uh, were actually having this system of, you know, as if a, a tug boats were available and they would then guide these incoming ships into, into the harbors, depending on uh, the tide as it, as, it, as it ebbs and flows. Uh, the second mention is about the eastern coast of India. Now, this is not Barugaza. Barugaza is Bar Barukach or Baruch on the, on the western coast. And this is a reference in section 60 about uh, Damerica, which is the name that the Periplus gives to Tamil Nadu, the Tamil coast. Uh, it is also in certain variations called Limurike. And uh, here it mentions three ports, Kamara, Poduka, and Sopatma. You know, I won't go into details of what exactly these are. There's huge amounts of material written on it. And uh, here it says that there are two simple, the, the two ships, they are uh, large vessels made up of single logs bound together. And this is, again, very interesting reference to the material of construction. So these um, logs, uh, made, ships made by tying the logs together were called sangara. And this is a, a, a word that is has connotations with the words in many uh, South Indian languages that means it has a connotation with trade. So obviously these were trading ships uh, somehow. And then he says that from this ship, then they go, um, there are also ships that go all the way to the mouths of the Ganges. And um, those are called Colandia, and these are these are very large. So obviously, there's a distinction between the kind of smaller trading ships that go from coastal hopping kind of routes and the 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 seagoing ships, which are uh, going all the way to the mouths of Ganges from from Tamil Nadu across the what is now the Bay of Bengal. Um, these um, connections, these networks that the Periplus mentions, are extremely well uh, illustrated in the uh, discoveries made at this little island of uh, Sokotra, which is in uh, the middle of nowhere, really. <laughs> it's in the middle of uh, Arabian Sea, just to the south of Yemen. It's part, technically part of Yemen. And um, um, recently, well, I say recently, about 20 years ago, uh, uh, a cave was discovered on these islands, which is uh, shown in this little uh, map. 
and cave uh, is called Hawk, is H-O-Q. You can see it on the right-hand side of the right-hand coast of the island. And within this cave, this is a kind of grotto that is it's a deep, deep cave. It's about one, one kilometer uh, deep cave. And inside this cave were um, uh, discovered lots and lots of uh, petroglyphs that were left there by sailors who were stopping by uh, en route to um, uh, India and sort of plying between the Eastern Mediterranean and the Red Sea and India's Western coast. And it is a microcosm of uh, what kind of communities that were um, plying along this thing. And this is a very famous depiction that was found amongst these petroglyphs. This is of um, uh, a ship uh, which has grown uh, carved, sort of um, etched onto uh, the rocky surface uh, of, the, of the floor of the cave. Um, so the evidence that we find from Sokotra is uh, extremely interesting. Uh, and it tells you um, in great details, and it, it shows a kind of important light on how these networks were sustained and who were the, who were the key, key players in keeping these uh, networks uh, alive, as it were. And you have inscriptions in, 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 on Sokotra, which are in, in um, Brahmi, which are in Karoshti, which are in uh, Ge'ez, which is this ancient script used in Ethiopia. All sorts of people, Bactrian also, I mean, all sorts of people are congregating here together. And this sort of gives us a very good idea about the cosmopolitan nature of, uh, uh, of um, uh, the, the, the trade that was happening along this uh, coast. And this is where we find the most significant uh, element, a numismatic element uh, uh, in, in the story, the most famous one as well. And uh, this was all happening close to the Satavahana supremacy in uh, the Deccan. So the Satavahanas were preeminent dynasty. And here uh, we see that the Satavahanas were actually involved in, in, um, in fostering these trades. Um, the actual coins that were found in um, across the regions uh, uh, can, can be some sort of an uh, indication of uh, the, 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 uh, the, the networks that were being, being, being uh, fostered here as well. On the top here, the gold coin is from Aksum, uh, the ancient Ethiopian kingdom. Um, and this, uh, the two piercings in it, the, the two holes that the coin has, actually shows that it was converted into jewelry when it arrived in India. So this, this, this is a, these piercings are very typical of, um, uh, of an Indian kind of style of wearing in, into jewelry. Um, and a lot of Indian coins also are found with these, these, these kind of double piercing. And you can see that the double piercing is made in a way as such to, uh, to show the, the picture of the king, which was obviously seen as exotic and novel and uh, some sort of novelty, uh, to show it clearly in whatever, uh, whenever the coin was used as a pendant in a, in a kind of necklace. So you can see that the, the goals are very carefully made along the two sides of the, of the, of the, two, of the head of the king. Um, down below on the right hand side, you see a lead coin, a Satavahana lead coin, which was discovered at Berenike in the re most recent uh, excavation seasons. The report just come out. I'm grateful to Steve Sidebottom to for, uh, publish, uh, furnish this image to me. And um, you can see that these coins would not have reached, the Satavahana coin would not have reached Berenike in Egypt and the Aksumite coin, the Ethiopian coin would not have reached the Indian coast had it not been for the trade which was conducted by ships in this thing, so uh, in, 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 the, in the Red Sea region. So the actual find spots of the coins in two different territories um, is also a, a kind of a denominator for imagining or visualizing uh, the, the, the trade networks that were fostered in the Red Sea region and in the Arabian Sea through uh, uh, ancient shipping. Um, by far the most uh, important and most famous coins uh, in, in the story at this time are of course the Satavahana coins, which actually were struck with an emblem of the, uh, of the, of, of the ship on it. Um, they were originally the first person to, uh, first Satavahana king to have issued these coins was Vasisti, Vasitiputa uh, Siripulu Mavi. Um, however, the more famous ones and the, the more uh, 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 talked about ones are issues of uh, Satavahana king Gotami Putta Siriyanya Satakani. And uh, here you see uh, a, a ship which is in its full splendor. It is clearly an ocean-going ship because it has two masts and it has sort of 
cross riggings, which are very clearly seen on, on both the coins here. Um, the lower coin here is from the British Museum's collection, and uh, it was wrongly uh, uh, published uh, as showing a fleet of ships. So for, what, what happened is that if you see uh, carefully, the ship has a kind of uh, a prow uh, on the left-hand side, uh, and it has two little projections coming out, and that was erroneously spotted as another different ship. So it was, this, was, this was seen as a kind of depiction of multiple ships. It is not a depiction of multiple ships, it is single ship, and it is what you see here are actually the materials of construction of, of these ships. Um, interestingly, this, this, this kind of, this particular depiction seems to have two very significant features in terms of its seaworthiness. I mean, most of these ships had to be, uh, had to go across the sea. Um, the two important features that these depictions show, one is a, a rudder. So you can see that on um, the, the top left coin here, there's a, a little rudder at the back uh, of the ship. The ship is moving from right to left. So it is facing, is going leftwards. And you can see that it's going leftwards because the pennants, the, the banners on the top of the, sh of the ship are actually fluttering in the opposite direction. So it is very clearly a ship going from uh, right to left. The, the prow is at towards the left, the stern is towards the right, and in the stern, there is, there is depiction of a rudder. Similarly, uh, the ship that is on the, on the lower coin appears to have a little boy, uh, which is B-U-O-Y, uh, attached to its hull in, near its prow. And this is a very important um, uh, construction feature because that the boys would keep the, the sheep uh, steady as it sort of moves. So there are some interesting details about the construction of the ship that one can one can one can spot in this um, these are larger units and both these coins are actually inscribed with the name of the satavahana king the legend on the top left coin is ranyo sami siri yanya satakanisa um, of course some letters are seen some are not whereas uh, the lower coin the one from the british museum uh, actually has the, a longer region and it has, also has the metronomic of the king's name included in it. Um, smaller fractions of these coins were also struck uninscribed. So they were not, they did not carry any, any inscriptions. So these are the two examples, again, both from uh, the collection of the British Museum. And here you can see on the top coin, that the boy it, attached to the to, to the to the prow of the ship is very very clear. It is it is it is definitely an appendage that the the ship has uh, a, an extra kind of body. The lower coin here actually shows the two rudders uh, very clearly on the on 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 the left hand side. And what is interesting also is the fact that the rigging of the ships is very clearly articulated on these coins. So there are two masts, and the, the two masts have two riggings each on either side and then in the center of the two masts they sort of come across uh, sort of they crisscross each other leading to this sort of uh, this sort of depiction and um, i talked i talked a, a little bit about visuality and you know uh, about stylization of how these things were actually depicted and you find exactly the same thing happening on other media so here is a, a potsherd uh, a redware potsherd that was found in, in the Alagan Kulam excavations in Tamil Nadu. And here uh, a kind of uh, a ship is, is kind of etched onto this pottery. And you can see it compares extremely well with uh, the ship that is depicted on the, the Satwahana uh, lead coin. Uh, typical riggings, typical uh, construction features, the two oars that are coming out of the, uh, of the ship on, on the left-hand side here on the, in, on the pottery. Again, you see the same things uh, on, on the coins as well. Um, so, so there is a kind of uh, uh, comparison that one can draw between these, these depictions. Um, objects which travel with the ships are always very interesting, and not only the objects that travel, you know, this, the, I'm talking about spaces here, and the connections that the, 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 the shipping uh, was actually achieving. Um, the top object here is a small gold seal, and it was found in Bang Khlai Nok in Thailand. This is a very important and interesting find. Very clearly, the, the workmanship of the seal is of Satavahana period. In the center, it also has this damru or, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, like symbol, which is a kind of a rendition of uh, the triangle headed standard or a, a kind of a banner or dhwaja that you see on lots of ancient art and coins cons uh, in, of, of this period. So it's a kind of rendering of that, that, that symbol. Interestingly, the seal actually belongs to a Navika, a, 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 a seagoing mariner, and his name is Brahaspati Sharma. So apart from the fact that he was a mariner, the ending of his name Sharma suggests that he was also a Brahmin. So this is a very interesting insight into who exactly was involved in the kind of seagoing in when you you know in later on we find that uh, Indians were very very famous for uh, observing this taboo of not crossing the seas you know the higher in your caste the you are obviously you observe these taboos more rigorously at least in second third century AD we do not find that these taboos really mattered here is a captain who is quite clearly a Brahmin as well and uh, he calls himself Navika and his name is Brihaspati Sharma so he's very much a, a, a person who was engaged in uh, seafaring as as part of his as his profession. Um, the lower coin here was actually discovered in the excavations at Tissamaharama in uh, um, Sri Lanka, and the typology of this coin is clearly copied from coins, contemporary coins, second century AD, third century AD coins from Andhra Pradesh, and it is absolutely well established from the inscriptions of. Uh, Ikshavaku's uh, kings if, that were found in Nagarjuna Konda, that they maintained uh, relationships between the monks, the, the Buddhist monks that were coming and going backwards and forwards to these sites from, uh, from Sri Lanka and uh, monasteries were created, constructed uh, for the benefit of, uh, of a habitation of these monks that were coming from Sri Lanka. We know that uh, from, from uh, um, Ikshavaku inscriptions. And here you have a clear numismatic evidence that the typology of coins that were circulating in Andhra at that time has influenced uh, the, the coins uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka. Now, why uh, you might might as well ask, why is this not a, a Andhra coin? Why is it why is it a Sri Lankan coin and it's not an Andhra coin? Why how do you say that this coin is not uh, actually struck in Andhra and then transported to Sri Lanka? Of course, that would also justify our story. However, the coin on the reverse has a very typical Sri Lankan symbol. There is a swastika standard, uh, and uh, it's a swastika on on a, on a post, it, 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 and it sits in a railing. So it's a kind of a standard which is erected or with a, with a, with a swastika on the top of it, and that is an ex, a, a symbolic um, a peculiarity that is associated exclusively with Sri Lankan coins. That is not seen on any coins, any ancient Indian coins, uh, any coins of ancient India at all. This particular swastika standard is a very peculiar Sri Lankan emblem, and that's what actually qualifies this coin as uh, a Sri Lankan coin and not a, uh, uh, an Andhra coin. However, the lion on the obverse is copied straight out of uh, uh, the coins that were circulating in Andhra at this time. So apart from the fact that coins have depictions of ships, uh, there are other ways that you know, uh, these objects can actually under help us understand uh, these networks better. Uh, moving on to about 5th or 6th century, the, sec the other dynasty, which is of course very famous for uh, showing ships on their coins, is the Pallavas. And again, the, the maritime uh, heritage and traditions and importance of the Pallavas is absolutely unparalleled. We know that Pallavas were instrumental in crossing the Bay of Bengal all the way to the Burmese coast, and this is where all the cultural happenings that, ha that, that sort of take off in Burma uh, are, are attributed to uh, mainly to the connections of uh, Burma uh, with uh, the Tamil coast. And the, the persons, the, the, the people, the dynasties that were involved in controlling the Tamil coast were here at this time, um, um, the, the followers. Here you see a slightly different execution of the ships at, apart uh, than the Satavahana coins. Of course, there are two masts. However, there are only two riggings. There are no, there are no sort of four riggings on either side. So here, I believe what has happened is that the riggings are sort of further stylized into a kind of a, you know, depiction. And um, you can see this, this kind of uh, stylization appearing in other forms of art as well. Um, not exactly contemporary, but close to this is uh, the cave art of Aurangabad. And um, we see here that this is the entrance uh, to, the, to the porch at cave number six. Uh, image taken uh, very kindly from Pierre Brancaccio's fabulous work on the Buddhist caves of Aurangabad. 
And uh, you can see that the, the panel here on the left-hand side is the depiction of an Avalokiteshvara who intervenes and helps people in distress. And these distresses or Mahabhayas, the great perils, are of eight kinds. And those eight great perils have been shown on either side of this uh, figure of Avalokiteshvara. And um, one of the great, great perils is actually the peril of shipwreck. And here uh, in this particular depiction, you see the shipwreck scene in the bottom left panel. And on each of these panels, there is a depiction of people in peril and then the Avalokiteshvara kind of flying in to, to help them. And so the, the, the depiction of uh, the shipwreck panel is here. You can see it in, in, in more detail. And here on the right hand side, the Avalokiteshvara is flying in, kind of, you know, coming down from the heavens to save these people who are, uh, who are stuck in, in, in the ship. And here you see the depiction of the ship is very comparable to the one on the Pallava coin. Uh, it has two masks in, 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 in the center and two lines of rigging, exactly as one, one sees on, on these coins. Um, quite famously, there are more depictions of uh, ships in Indian art, and the most stunning examples are of these two murals from Ajanta Cave 2. Uh, the one on the, on the top left shows a ship with sails, and there are actually um, objects of trade uh, fitted in it. There are little jars that one can see. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the art of Ajanta is so fabulous for its details that it's absolutely breathtaking. One can gaze at these paintings for, for um, you know, hours and you can still see something new in, in, in shown, shown in them. And uh, the panel on the, on the right-hand side is part of, the, of a larger panel, which uh, Dieter Schlingloff uh, very eruditely uh, described as the story of Kalyanakarin and Papakarin, the two brothers who were traders and how uh, the story uh, developed. Um, these two examples have been, you know, two, two depictions of the ships are most famously taken from uh, Dieter's uh, fantastic article, Kalyanakarin's Adventures, the identification of an Ajanta painting that appeared a long time ago. And you can see that here, the depiction of the ships is very, very close to reality. There are, there are ships, there, there are sails, there are oars, there are trade, trading goods inside the ship. There, is the, there are pennants, banners, decorative aspects. The left-hand side image shows Kalyanakarin leaving on, on his sea voyage. And here you see that the, the, the ship actually has a kind of a house-like structure inside it where, where everybody is habiting. We'll, we'll come back to that in, in towards, towards a, a later pro, uh, part of this presentation. But this is also very interesting that the ships were actually supplied with habitative uh, uh, aspects of construction as well. Um, coming to uh, the middle of uh, the first millennium, the visual evidence, particularly in terms of coins, uh, sort of starts disappearing very fast. And thankfully, there was a recent discovery, which I will show you in a minute, um, that has helped us uh, eradicate this problem uh, to a certain extent. Um, but of course, there are literary mentions of the ships. And, you know, this has been um, first put together by uh, the famous scholar Radha Kumud Mukherjee, whose book on, uh, uh, you know, ancient Indian shipping is kind of a Bible for anyone who's uh, interested in knowing more about uh, the shipping and, and navigation in ancient India. Um, um, the Kautilya Arthashastra mentions there's a, a chapter uh, called Superintendent of Ships and His Duties. And in that you have uh, mentions of uh, large ships, Mahanava, um, which have Shasaka and Niyamaka. Now, Niyamaka is a very typical uh, 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 term that is mostly used to suggest captain, whereas the Shasaka is the coordinator or the governor. So uh, in, in Kautilya's parlance, the superintendent of ships is, is a shasaka, is, 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 is the person who actually governs the department, but the persons who are actually governing the ships in, 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 as units are niyamakas or, or, or captains. The Jain text Angavidja has a massive uh, classification of ships which is listed in them, and it uses a very interesting term to, for, for, the, for, for ships itself. It calls this Nijiva Jalacharini. It is, it is supposed to be a lifeless, uh, sea dwelling creature so this is this is this is what this is what it refers to the the um, the ships as 
It, they are classified in four groups, uh, large, which is exemplified by Pota or Nava, middle, which are a few examples, and there is Tappaka and Kotumba and Salika. Here we see Tappaka and Kotumba are our old friends that we meet in the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. These are the very ships that the Periplus mentions that uh, were guiding uh, uh, the incoming trading ships into the harbors at Barugaza. So this is the kind of giant version of the same names. And it is, a, it is an interesting insight, rare, rare, in, in, I, wish, I should say, rare interesting uh, insight into the intertextuality between two textual sources, one coming from a Western source and one coming from an Indian source, actually using the same terms to describe uh, the ships. Then there were small ships, which were made of bamboo and reeds, and very small ships. And these are actually floats. This is, this is, this is where, where we go back to the depiction from the Sanchi stupa, and these are very small ships, and they are basically kumbhas or tumbas, which are inflatables, uh, which people actually held on to while they, they, they floated down, down the river. So even those um, have been re regarded as ships by the Angavidja. In medieval uh, India, about 10th century, uh, the text Yukti Kalpataru of Boja uh, elaborates even this classification even further. So here you have a, a much more elaborate classification of ships, there are two major types of ships that it mentions. One is called Samanya, uh, which is common, as in smaller. And those are basically the river-going ships. And there are 10 types of river-going ships. The larger ships are called Vishesha, the big ones, and the special ones, really. And um, they are there are two subtypes of, of Vishesha ships. And each of them has 10 and 5 varieties, respectively. It's a very elaborate classification. What is very interesting about Yukti Kalpataru is that it also gives us the measurements the length, breadth, and height of these ships, all, all these types that it, that it lists. Um, it also uses words such as Yanapatra and Vahitra, which are, uh, which are the, the, the latter one. Yanapatra is just any ship, but Vahitra is, is definitely something which is uh, used especially for Dvipantara voyages, the, the voyages that take you from one island to the other, so one place to the other. So these are definitely a reference to a trans-oceanic kind of, kind of uh, ship. Um, then, of course, there are lots and lots of references for terminologies, the technical and construction features like sails, or helms, rigging, and they are found everywhere in ancient India. They're scattered across ancient Indian literature. They are in Arthashastra, they are in, they are in Jain sources, they are in Buddhist sources, they are in um, sources like the Ramayana, and there is a, an entire topic here that, that one, can, one can talk about. Um, as so far, we've been looking at sea as a place of, uh, you know, of connections and, you know, and, and how, how networks were fostered across the sea. But the, 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 the fact that the sea was also a place of commerce, where commerce was taking place, was also, um, it also made the sea into a space of contestation, a space, a space of conflict. It is not just not, a, you know, no, not everything was hunky-dory in seas. The sea, seas were actually... Uh, uh, theaters of war and theaters of, uh, of, of great uh, conflicts. And that you find very earlier on, because, you know, in Gautami Putasiri Satakani, when he defeated the, the, the Western Shatraps in first century AD, you find him described by his son in his famous eulogy at Nasik uh, with this title, T. Samudha Toya Pita Vahana, the, the, the man whose, whose uh, horses, whose, whose vehicles, whose vahanas, have drank from the three oceans. So his, his kingdom extends to the coasts of all the three oceans. So the ocean, the sea here becomes a metaphor for conquest uh, for uh, very earlier on. Of course, a very, very uh, important and very significant, very clear reference to sea battles in the medieval times is to be glossed from the uh, I holy inscription of uh, Pulakeshin II and his, his nephew Mangalisha, which refers to the sea war, the Chalukyas, waged against the Mauryas of Konkan, and um, uh, where it's famously said that the, the capital of Mauryas of Konkan was destroyed by the fleet of uh, the warships of uh, the Chalukyas, who um, basically struck the, the capital uh, like, like, a, like a bunch of uh, mad or, uh, you know, or, or um, uh, irate elephants. So this is, this is what, 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 what the metaphor that is being used. The titles of the rulers, such as uh, later rulers, such as Yadava, Shilaharas, also indicate that they were the lords of the Western Ocean. So Paschima Samudra Adhipati is one of the kind of titles that, that is one. So, so, so it's very clear from these depictions that 
the sea was not just a connecting space, but it was also a space for conflict. Um, and uh, the commerce that, that it generated obviously was at the root of this conflict. The, 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 the commerce has generated income, and this is what this is what uh, uh, what the um, the dynasties in these parts were actually buying or, uh, or competing after. At this time, we have uh, examples of Arab. I'm, I'm putting that word in quotes for purpose because we really don't know what Arab means at this time. It is you know somebody from the Arabian Peninsula, but it, ethnically it could be anything. It could be uh, Kurdish, it could be Iranian, it could be you know really uh, literally Arabs or anything anybody else. Um, in sort of an umbrella term uh, being used for is, is Arab. It's not, please don't take this into a, it's kind of real, uh, real uh, you know, um, proper ethnic kind of sense. And, and there is involvement of Islam as well, because by this time, the, the population on the Arabian Peninsula to the West has are now converted to Islam. And um, they, uh, their commercial links and networks of trade is a very interesting topic of interest, uh, uh, of, of, of study. We know that Rashtrakutas uh, had an Arab uh, governor called Madhumati, which is obviously a Sanskritization of the word Muhammad, uh, ruling at Sanjan. We know, know from uh, the copper plate grants of Rashtrakuta king Indra III, uh, which are issued in early 10th century AD, that a governor named Madhumati uh, or Muhammad was ruling on the behalf of Rashtrakutas in, at Sanjan. And in that copper plate is mentioned that uh, Muhammad was actually very powerful and he um, subdued uh, lots of coastal kings and won over their harbors and controlled them. So this is a very clear uh, reference to the fact that harbors were considered as important entrepots, the entering points of the, of the, of the, of the trades. The Shilaharas also make Muslim uh, mentions of Arab or Muslim statesmen in their court. And by far the most important uh, uh, depictions or uh, sorry, mentions of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Muslim uh, ministers is from the courts of the Kadambas. And you have two copper plate grants, the, the Marcel grant of Shashtadeva and the Panaji uh, grant of Jayakeshin I, both make a reference to uh, this particular character called Chadam. And we don't know what exactly his uh, Islamic version of that name is. And he is mentioned, described as, as, as a very rich person. And he's also described as a soft-spoken captain. He's, he's of course, a, a, a commander in trade. And Chadama was uh, subsequently given uh, a permission to erect a mosque uh, for the benefit of his community at Panaji. And this is what uh, is being referred to in this, in this, uh, in this uh, copper plate grants. The Yadava and Shilahara rivalry that panned out in 12th century and 13th century is of course uh, uh, the conquest of North Konkan. And it is, as some of you might be aware of, uh, the very famous uh, Exer uh, memorial stones at Burivli in North Mumbai have been um, considered or suggested to be, there's a naval battle depicted on, on these, these hero stones, and it is, it is, it is suggested to be uh, a kind of depiction between the last battle of the Shilaharas, in which the Shilaharas lost and therefore lost their kingdom to the, the Yadavas. Um, there are further, slightly later examples of uh, Islamic uh, rulers uh, ruling on behalf of Indian dynasties, such as the Vaghelas of Gujarat. In Veraval inscription, you find a mention of a person called Nuruddin Firuz, who calls himself the Sultan of Seamen and also uh, 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 the Prince of Traders. Both, both the titles with that he uses are very interesting. And under the Hoysalas, we know that uh, Honnavar, uh, the trading post on the Karnataka coast, was actually ruled by a Muslim ruler uh, uh, by the name of Jamaluddin Khan. Uh, these are all attestations made in, in, uh, and, uh, in, in their inscriptions. And you can see that seafaring, shipbuilding, all these things were connected to the control of the seas as a potentially a, a space of, of conflict. And this is what is quite, uh, in, that's quite, quite interesting. In this context, uh, as I said, uh, uh, there was not much numismatic evidence available for, for this period. And that has been recently outdone by the discovery of this really nice Kadamba gold coin. This was, this was uh, offered at a numismatic auction not so long ago. And this is the first time we see the depiction of a ship on a medieval uh, gold Indian coin. And this is a gold Gadiana of uh, the Kadambas of Goa, very typical design. Uh, those who, who uh, those of who are who are familiar with Kadamba coinage will immediately recognize this as a Kadamba coin because the the, the design is so specifically stylized. 
that you have this roaring lion on one side, which was a dynastic emblem of the Kadambas. And on the reverse, there is this typical trident on the right-hand side image you can see. There's a typical trident there, which is a kind of Shaivite Pashupata uh, trident, which is again kind of acts as a, an, a dynastic emblem of the, of the Kadambas. Um, and the inscription uh, below is in early Nagari and it reads Shri Malahara Mari. And that is a, a, a kind of an appellation that uh, the Kadambas use um, to, to suggest that, uh, the, that they were the conquerors of the Malaharas. And these Malaharas were, uh, are, 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 uh, uh, are judged to be or understood, understood to be the people, the, king, the, the inhabitants of the hills. So Kadambas being a coastal power then sort of go towards the east and conquer the hill uh, dwelling people. That is what the title suggests. But in front of the, the, the gaping mouth of the lion, you see that there is this absolutely clear depiction of a ship which has this, this, this habitational structure in, in between. Above the habitational structure, there appears to be a, a semicircular line, which is probably the depiction of a sail in a stylized manner. So this is, this is, this is a sailing boat and it has three oars uh, that, are, that are sort of projecting against it. Towards, uh, you can see that the ship is actually moving from, again here, from right to left. The prow is, is, is towards the front, so on the left-hand side, and the stern is at the back. The stern seems a kind of high uh, stern, and which is very similar uh, features can be seen in present-day Dhaus and Bagalas and these, these kind of Arab ships, that they have this kind of high posterior end, and then the prow then uh, sort of uh, streamlines towards, uh, towards the front. Um, Quite interestingly, uh, uh, this depiction again is quite comparable to uh, some of these um, hero stone objects. And these are three hero stones, which are in the uh, Goa Archaeology Museum, which is in Old Goa. And uh, they are found in the vicinity of uh, Old Goa. So for example, we know that one of these was found at Agashi. Uh, one, of the, one of them was found between uh, on the road between uh, Old Goa and Panaji. So, and these are proper Kadamba uh, hero stones, and they have references to naval battles. And as you as you might be aware, that hero stones have this particular feature that there are these these ascending panels. They ascend from lower end to, to the top end. The person who uh, whose memory they are erected to commemorate uh, is shown usually uh, the cause of his death is shown in the lowest panel. The battle that he that he uh, that he died in is shown in the lowest panel. Then he's shown uh, lifted up by by celestial uh, 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 women, and then at the final top uh, top panel, he's of course shown um, uh, as res residing in Kailasa, and then of course uh, then in, in, in worshiping uh, a Shivalinga. So this is this is this is what a typical uh, depiction of these hero stones is. And um, very interestingly, you can see that on the lower panels of all these three hero stones, there are naval battles depicted. So whoever this 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 particular uh, heroes were. They were, they were commemorated, their death was commemorated, and they had died in a naval battle. Um, here is a, a close-up of, uh, of, the, of the hero stone, and here you see very clearly a comparable depiction to the, this, the depiction that we just saw on the coin. Here is a ship, it has uh, se seven oars, uh, and then at, at the back there is this, uh, uh, towards the right, there is this high platform-like uh, uh, feature and the prow is is towards towards the towards the uh, left hand side. Um, very similar a depiction here again, and the lower end of the of the first hero stone. This is absolutely comparable. You can see that it is you know the the the, the high end uh, of the on the right hand side. This is the habitational bit. You can see that the same thing is on coins. Of course, on the hero stone, there is a soldier fighting and and piercing an arrow into this this uh, land based warrior here. What is um, Particularly interesting is that this this ship appears to have little wheels in the hero stones at, at the bottom. So this is a ship which is probably about to be lowered into into the into the into the sea, as it were. It was being constructed and it's still under construction or just finished construction, and it was about to be lowered into into the sea. This is a very interesting detail that one has one can observe in the in the hero stone. But the comparison of the the ship on the Kapalava, uh, on the Kadamba gold coin and the Kadamba hero stone is absolutely clear. And there is, the, one, one need not say anything uh, more about it. Uh, that brings us very nicely to about 11th century, the kind of end of the first millennium. So I would like to conclude by saying a few last concluding remarks. 
Boats and ships and money have been interlinked for at least two millennia, if not more. And you know, can, as I showed, they 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 have uh, these bonds between boats, ships, seafaring, and money has have been right since uh, uh, the the inception of of coin money, really, in in the world. Um, we talked about uh, these spaces, uh, which are network spaces, and they inhabit uh, trade, commerce, and connectivity. But the spaces are also linked to notions of sovereignty, power, and promise. And the topic that it I did not really touch upon, but one can, is of insubordination, of actually uh, activities like piracy, which are against uh, the, the rules that the kings are trying to impose on, on seafaring. So this is a, this is a very interesting uh, topic on, on its own right. The imagery on coins uh, gives us a window into this various symbiotic relationship. That's the, you know this is going back to the actor network theory. This is this is what it is uh, the shipping the, the the symbolism that the ships kind of develop. So we know that on Satavahana coins the ship is a symbol of international trade and prosperity. On Kadamba coins, maybe it is a symbol of warfare and power in, in a different way, because we can see that the ship is very much comparable to the depiction of a warship that we that we that we saw on the on the hero stone. So there are these different registers of semiotic relationships that one uh, can use the coin imagery to posit the coin imagery into these uh, depictions. Um, there are parallels one can draw with other depictions, such as from art. I've shown you many examples of, uh, of uh, depictions from art that, uh, that the coin imagery can actually draw, draw parallel. But one has to remember that these depictions are stylized. And the stylization here is very important element in understanding the imagery, because we have to bear in mind that this is not a real, it is not like a photograph uh, <laughs> uh, kind of depiction onto the coin. It's, it's the rendering of the artist to actually show something which is much, much, much larger into a much, much, much smaller object. Uh, so it is, it is what it is, uh, it, it actually uh, means to him uh, as when he tries to show it. Um, the shipping, uh, as we can see, is uh, a connecting medium where money travels. We saw examples of coins traveling from India to Egypt and from Ethiopia back to India. And this actually feeds into a wider debate and what Arjuna Padurai calls a finance scape. He's talking about the kind of geography of money, the kind of landscape that the finance, the financial uh, activities generate in its own right. It's, it, it, is, it is a very different sort of geography. It has a very different sort of boundaries, as one can imagine. And uh, he uses this, uh, this portmanteau word called finance scape uh, to describe that. And this actually puts us in context with um, uh, the subjects like geography of money. So the depictions on coins are not just, uh, you know, symbolic depictions or, or comparative uh, tools of our understanding. They have a much bigger story uh, behind them. And of course, um, uh, this is uh, a very important evidence for um, uh, our, our understanding of material culture studies in a much wider way. So thanks everyone for, for listening and I uh, hope you're all keeping safe. I shall now uh, end this show, and as I have been advised, I will come back live after five minutes again, and I would like to take uh, answer some of the questions which I believe have been forwarded to me while the presentation was going on. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, keep well, keep safe, and keep busy. Uh, all the best. Thanks a lot. Okay, um, welcome again. Uh, I think I'm, I've got um, a few questions uh, to answer, uh, as I was told. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, start uh, answering them uh, one by one. Uh, Kanchana has uh, very kindly sent them to me on WhatsApp. So pardon me if I look too much at my phone uh, and not up uh, uh, while I'm, I'm actually answering these, uh, these questions. So, um, the first question was uh, by Parul Pandyadhar, and she asks, um, what, as per Professor B. N. Mukherjee's reading, does the text on the terracotta ceiling read as? Um, he tries to uh, read uh, something like Trapyaga on one of them. And uh, obviously, his, um, his information is, um, 
informed <laughs> by uh, the readings uh, from Periplus and other sources. Um, he hasn't uh, furnished a full reading of any of these seals. He does say that there are, you know, these are these are letters which are in kind of a, a mixed uh, um, script, which is a kind of mixture of Brahmi and Karushti. I mean, this is all extremely controversial. But uh, unfortunately, as I said, um, um, those pictures that I showed in my presentation were all were were, were from uh, Ranabir Chakravarti's uh, essay. Um, that he appeared that appeared on uh, one of the uh, in, in an edited volume, and he kind of um, repeats those 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 uh, uh, inscriptions uh, in spite of the fact that they have been uh, controversial. And uh, well, I mean, I, I I personally tend to believe that there is there is no uh, but not particular um, sense in actually that theory that this is a script which is uh, written um, uh, half Brahmi and half Karoshti or whatever. So, um, so that those readings are not really uh, very, very reliable, and not that all have been uh, read as well. Some, some have been, and some have not. So, I believe uh, that uh, answers uh, Parul's question uh, fairly. Um, um, the second question was um, by Rajesh Purohit, and what about? He says the first question is what about the monsoonal trade wind in the East Coast and the Southeast Asian and Far Eastern trade with India? Kalinga trade with these countries. Obviously, uh, you can talk about a lot about these 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 aspects. Uh, there are um, evidences that are available of various sorts and kinds. Uh, and but, however, one has to um, keep oneself confined when one has one one hour or less than that to talk. Um, one needs to sort of make uh, make and you know uh, make these kind of decisions to choose what to what to focus on. Um, I have in other presentations or other lectures or other publications, I have actually dwelt upon there's a, there's a there's a presentation there's a, um, a paper which will, which will soon soon come on in print, uh, which is all about the connections between India's um, uh, Andhra coast and uh, the coast in Burma, and it's a presentation talking about the numismatic landscape of um, of Andhra Pradesh in the first four centuries AD, and there I've shown. Uh, interesting symbolic connections between the coins that were in circulation in in uh, andhra and adjoining areas and on the other side of the of the coast um fourth question is uh, it doesn't have any name attached to it but it says angavijja's elaborate classification of ship types is very interesting any reference to Jaina seafarers in the text? Not really, because Angavija, as you know, is a, as you might know, is is a, it's a text that actually tells you about how to understand the nature of people up with their appearances. And there is no um, there is no clear reference to seafarers as such. But there are, you know, there are I mean Jaina seafarers as such, because of course there are there are there are these uh, verses that actually talk about uh, the types of ships. Um, I haven't, of course, read the entire text. It is quite a quite a major text, uh, quite a big text. I was focusing on uh, on the depictions of uh, of the descriptions of the of the ships into into this. So um, it's not going to be uh, the same, uh, completely the same thing. Um, fifth question is from Suchandra uh, uh, Suchandra Ghosh, my old friend. Hello. <laughs> Uh, so, so he's called Nakhuda Nuruddin Firoz. Why do you translate Nakhuda as Sultan? I'm not translating Nakhuda as Sultan. In the inscription, he actually uses the word uh, the Sultan, the princess, the Sultan of uh, of uh, Nakhuda is another title. There are three titles that he uses, and um, the Sultan of the of the seamen uh, is is a different title. And there's also the third title, which says uh, uh, the Lord. Um, how would you put it? The Lord of uh, uh, Merchantsmen, the you know the, the, the trading community. So there are three things. He's 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 a, he's a ship's captain. He is he's, uh, supposedly a sultan of uh, of um, of the seafarers and also uh, uh, the the prince of 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 tradesmen. So there is a much more elaborate uh, uh, depiction uh, description of uh, this guy called uh, Sultan uh, Nuruddin uh, Nuruddin Firoz. Next question is by Vijay Naik, and he says he asks, "Has somebody worked on showing or drawing realistic pictures or sketches of uh, these various types of ships uh, shown on coins and hero stones?" Um, yes, they have. I mean, a lot of people have tried to actually show um, in in their own renderings. I mean, I showed some pictures by Dieter Schlingloff, 
uh, in his in his landmark article about the Kalyanakarin's uh, voyage, uh, the murals in in Ajanta. Um, so there are there have been these attempts of actually rendering these into an artistic form and see what exactly it shows. Except that, of course, I I did not show all of these. Um, in the same paper, Dieter Schillinglof also produces uh, drawings of um, many different kinds of ships that one sees, including the ships on the Satavahana coins uh, and from other sources uh, such as uh, um, uh, seals, etc. There, there is a whole corpus of uh, of drawings that has been uh, given by uh, Dieter Schillinglof uh, in, in his paper. Um, seventh question is by Mukesh Sharma. And he asks, where can we see these original coins depicting ships? So um, I believe that, uh, as I said, uh, some of, the, well, one of them at least is in the private collection. Uh, there are, uh, the coins that I showed in the presentation uh, were from two sources. The Satavahana coins were from the British Museum's collection, and they belong to two very early collections of uh, Indian coins in the British Museum, and they are, um, from the collection of Sir Walter Elliot and uh, Alexander Rhee, uh, who obviously both of them collected coins in the coastal regions of uh, Andhra Pradesh in mid 19th century. So they're very uh, significantly much older uh, collections of Indian coins. The two Pallava coins were also, or were from the collection of uh, the American Numismatic Society of New York. And there they have been donated by another very significant, important uh, early collector of Indian coins, the uh, early 20th century collector of Indian coins, who subsequently became uh, a curator at the American Numismatic Society as well. And his name is E.T. Newell. And they're from, uh, they're from his collection. So I believe you've got your answers uh, uh, about uh, uh, where, the, at least the where institutionally, uh, those coins which are in institutional collections, where where have they been deposited? I have actually annotated the slides. If you go back to the slides, I've said I've said uh, given the sources of most of them. Um, the last question uh, is uh, by Jaya Nair, and it's she asks me, how do you say for sure a seal is a seal and not a coin? Um, well, I mean those are two very different functional objects. Seals are usually used to stamp something onto uh, as a kind of a signature on um, on you know a, 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 a clay or terracotta or something like that, or maybe even paper uh, uh, or, or whatever objects uh, were used to write. So seal is a validating instrument, and a coin is actually a circulatory uh, object. So a coin obviously uh, functions as money rather than anything else. And most of the time, the, the difference is right in the material, the, the, in, the, in the way they're made. Seals usually have negative impressions of uh, the inscriptions on them, whereas coins are positively struck. They, you can read the inscriptions and everything is in positive, uh, whereas seals will all, always have... Uh, the, the, the seal that was found in Thailand, uh, was, which images I showed, there are two images in that particular slide. Uh, there are images where the negative impression is seen and then that image is flipped uh, on, on the other side uh, using Photoshop, of course, uh, to show actually the positive uh, legend. So the Navika Rahaspati Sharma inscription is actually uh, inscribed on the seal in the negative. That is, that is, that is, what, uh, that is what makes makes a seal. So I believe um, um, these, are, these are all the questions that uh, I was sent. And uh, uh, I believe if there are any other questions, you could always post it on the page and uh, the organizers of the page will uh, subsequently um, let me uh, send them to me and I'll, I'll, I'll try my uh, best to uh, answer them. So um, all the best again. Uh, I really enjoyed this session and thanks Dr. Sate and uh, Kanchana for uh, coordinating uh, this. So with that, I shall uh, end this uh, question and answer sessions. Thank you. Bye-bye.